Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you might be joining us from, and welcome to Wise at Work Virtual Communities. My name is Parneet Paul. I'm the Chief Science Officer at Wisdom Labs, and I'm so happy that you're joining us today for this beautiful session on What You Practice Grows Stronger, The Power of Mindfulness with our very special guest, Shauna Shapiro. Now, I'm, you know, if you've been joining us for these sessions every single week, we're so happy to see you back. We're building such an amazing community here online. But if it's your first time with us at Wisdom Labs, we are a San Francisco-based company solving for stress, burnout, and loneliness in the workplace. And we use the science of mindfulness, resilience, and compassion to build communities of practice just like this uh, in organizations globally. And our aim and our aspiration is to scale mental, emotional, and social well-being within companies. And our response to COVID has been to organize these Wednesday half-hour sessions where we're able to bring in uh, our friends and experts in this field who are very generously donating their time to share their wisdom and expertise so that all of us can learn and practice together uh, and really build our resilience in response to these extraordinary times that we find ourselves in. Now, I would love for all of you to use a chat room throughout uh, this session and please start thinking about the questions that you might want to ask Shauna uh, and keep posting them and, and then I'll pick a few at the end uh, after her presentation. So without further ado, I'm really delighted to welcome Shauna Shapiro today. Um, I first came across Shauna's work a few years ago and um, I read about this unique model of mindfulness that she had created. And I was immediately struck by how simple and elegant it was, but how deeply rooted in science it was as well. And as I've gotten to know Shauna and for the rest of us who know her as well, she's synonymous with the phrase, good morning, I love you, uh, which also happens to be the title of her new book that I highly recommend that everybody check out as well. Now, uh, in addition to being a best-selling author, Shauna is also a professor and researcher at Santa Clara University. She's a world-renowned speaker. She's spoken in um, many different Fortune 100 companies, but also with uh, she's presented to the King of Thailand, the Danish and Canadian government. And um, she is also uh, the speaker of a very popular TEDx talk. So it's been viewed more than one and a half million times. Uh, so if you haven't seen that already, right after the session, go check that out. It's called The Power of Mindfulness. Uh, so I'm very happy now to turn this over and see what Shauna has to say about how we can really use the time that we have right now to grow our practices uh, and build our resilience. So welcome again, Shauna. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Parmi. I'm really delighted to be joining you and, and everyone who's here. I'm really amazed and inspired to see so many people joining from all over the world and I think all of us feel the impact of these times in our nervous systems and our hearts. And it's just beautiful to be coming together to engage in these practices that truly can grow resilience and grow our capacity to meet the present moment. So I'll be speaking about mindfulness. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the word mindfulness means to see clearly. So all we're trying to do is see clearly what's true, so we can respond effectively. There's been decades of research showing the impact of mindfulness on our personal well-being in terms of our immune functioning. It decreases stress, it reduces cortisol, it helps us sleep better. But it also has huge impact in the organization. It helps us focus our attention. It helps increase productivity, innovation, creativity and company loyalty. In terms of my current research, something I'm very interested in is how can mindfulness improve our ethical decision-making? How can it reduce cultural bias? And how can it increase compassion both for others and for ourselves? And so I, what we're finding is that mindfulness is this incredibly powerful tool that impacts our physiology, that can literally re-architect the very structure of our brain that impacts our interpersonal relationships and our capacity in the workplace. 
And so I want to talk a little bit about what mindfulness is. Thank you, Parmeet, for talking about my model. I developed this model of mindfulness to help people understand mindfulness um, both very simply, but also in with great depth. And so there's three elements to the model, intention, attention, and attitude. And I wanna talk about each of these. Our intention is really knowing why am I paying attention? We have so much information coming at us all the time. And it's really important to know what is most important, right? What is the most important thing? And so our intention helps us zero in on why am I paying attention? So often people say that time is our most valuable resource. They're wrong. It's our attention. And so we need to protect it and really guide it. And this is what our intention does. The second element of mindfulness is our attention. And this is referring to being able to stabilize our attention in the present moment so we can see clearly. And yet focusing our attention is somewhat difficult. In fact, I've been speaking for just a couple of minutes and my guess is many of you have noticed that your mind has already wandered off. And so part of mindfulness is learning how to bring it back, how to train and stabilize our attention right here in this moment. This is kind of hard to do because research shows that our mind wanders 47% of the time. This was done with a study at Harvard with 650,000 data points. And what they found is that the mind, it just naturally wanders. So part of mindfulness is learning how to train and stabilize this mind. And it's not about doing it perfectly. None of us are gonna be able to sustain and focus our attention perfectly all the time. But can we increase this number, even 5%? Can I focus a little bit more attention? And so as I'm speaking for these next 20 minutes, see if you can continue to bring your mind back right here into this moment. The final element of mindfulness is our attitude. This is a very important and I think probably the most overlooked in mindfulness. So our attitude has to do with how we're paying attention, paying attention with kindness, paying attention with curiosity and I wanna explain why this is so important. When I first started studying and teaching mindfulness, I was amazed that of the thousands and thousands of people I was working with, from women with breast cancer to high level CEOs to stressed out college students, everyone was talking about the same thing. This tremendous self-judgment this sense of I'm not good enough, I'm not doing it right, there's something wrong with me. And so I became very interested in studying the science of shame. What happens when we shame ourselves? Does it make us better? Do we improve? And what I discovered is that shame doesn't work. Shame can't work. Literally, when we shame and judge ourselves, we, we rob ourselves of the very resources we need to change. And the reason for this is that shame shuts down the learning centers of the brain. So this fMRI shows your brain on shame. And what happens is the amygdala, the amygdala triggers this cascade of norepinephrine and adrenaline that shuts down the learning centers and shuttles our resources to survival pathways. Shame literally prevents us from, from having the capacities, the resilience, the resources to learn from our mistakes and grow. So the alternative, right? We, we don't wanna stay stuck. We don't, we don't wanna just let ourselves off the hook. We, we need an alternative route. And the surprising alternative is this attitude of kindness. That when we bring kindness to our mistakes or to our pain or to a certain situation, it actually bathes our system with dopamine. This turns on our learning and motivation centers and gives us the resources we need to change. So mindfulness then is all three of these elements, intention, attention, and attitude. So what I'd like to do is just have us very briefly practice this. You can let your eyes close. And just take a moment to arrive here in your body in this moment and just reflect on your intention for being here. 
Maybe it's for greater clarity or greater peace. Maybe it's to learn. Whatever it is, feel the wholesomeness, the purity of heart, right? None of us are here to learn how to steal and cheat. There's this real beauty and innocence in our intention. So feel your intention and then gather your attention right here in the present moment. You can feel your breath flowing in and out of the body. Letting the breath anchor you right here. And then infusing your attention with an attitude of kindness, of curiosity. What does it feel like right now in your body? Can you bring 5% more kindness, 5% more openness, allowing whatever's here just to be here? Maybe softening the body, relaxing 5% more. Again, this isn't about perfect, it's about practice. Maybe even letting there be a gentle smile on your mouth the smile sends a biochemical message to our nervous system that we're safe, that we can rest. And as you're ready, taking a deeper breath in and out. And again, just feeling those three elements of mindfulness, your intention, attention, and attitude. You can let some light come back in through the eyes and maybe just stretch your arms above your head. I don't have any scientific data about stretching, but it feels good. Good. So I wanna to talk to you a bit about the power of practice. We just engaged in a very short meditation. And a lot of times people ask, you know, do I actually need to meditate or can, can I just understand mindfulness? And what I am really interested in is, is how we learn. And what we've discovered is you don't learn just by hearing information we have to actually install it. And so I wanna to talk to you about the power of practice. As recently as the 1990s, we thought that our brain was static and fixed, that it couldn't change. It's called the doctrine of the unchanging brain. And we've discovered, as many of you know, I think one of the most important discoveries in the last 400 years is neuroplasticity the recognition that our brain is constantly changing. It's constantly growing based on repeated practice. So really the hallmark of neuroplasticity is what you practice grows stronger. One of the famous studies is a study with London taxi drivers. This is a map of London. It has 25,000 streets. And these cabbies would learn over the course of four years how to navigate these streets. And what happened after this repeated practice is the visual spatial mapping part of the brain grew bigger and stronger. This is called cortical thickening, the growth of new neurons in response to repeated practice. What you practice grows stronger. And this is true not just during meditation, but in any moment. In any moment, we're growing something. And so what this means and why it's so hopeful is that all of us have the capacity to change. No matter what has happened to you, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what your current life looks like, all of us have the capacity to literally re-architect our brain. We can even rewire our brain for greater happiness. And this is such good news because we've always known in psychology about something called a happiness set point, which basically means that our happiness levels don't tend to change throughout our life that you're born with a certain baseline. And it's based on decades of research showing that if you win the lottery, you have this initial blip of happiness. One year later, you go back to your baseline. Even more surprising, you're in a terrible accident. You become paralyzed for life. Your happiness plummets, but then one year later, you are also back to your baseline. So this is great news if you're born happy, right? Life knocks you down, you pop back up. But if you weren't born happy, this is not such good news. Because no matter how many changes you make in your external life, 
no matter how many wins and successes, it doesn't change your overall level of happiness. External changes don't change your happiness. But, and here's where it gets really hopeful, internal changes can. Happiness can be trained because the very structure of your brain can be modified. We can all learn practices to rewire the brain and grow our resources. Again, what you practice grows stronger. So the real question that arises is, what do you want to grow? In every moment we're practicing something, right now you're practicing. So the question that you want to ask yourself is, what do you want to grow? So take a moment, let your eyes close. Feel your body, feel your breath. And your intention is simply to listen for what do I want to grow? It could be more peace, more clarity, more patience. And asking yourself with an attitude of kindness, of curiosity, not in a judgmental way, like this is what I need to get better at. That doesn't work with a great deal of compassion and tenderness. What do I wanna grow? Feel the breath, feel the body. Maybe softening the body 5% more, opening and listening. And then into this space, I want you to reflect on one thing that you've learned in this conversation so far. I call these gold nuggets. And what we know is that we learn based on the peak and the end of an experience. And so as we're moving closer to the end of this conversation, I want just to take a moment to have you reflect on what was your one pith teaching? What was one thing you wanna remember? It could be what you practice grows stronger, it could be that kindness turns on the learning centers of the brain, or that shame doesn't work, or the power of intention, whatever it is for you, just finding one phrase or word, and just holding it in your mind's eye for a moment, really encoding it in your long-term memory. What research shows is when we stay with this for 30 seconds or three deep breaths, it really anchors it in our memory. And so as you're ready, you can take a deeper breath in and out. You can let your eyes open. Good. So I want to take a moment to thank you so much for taking the time to practice and engage in these teachings with me. And I think the most important thing is to really trust that the seeds we're planting, that they're going to continue to grow. And one of the things for me that gives me great comfort, I've been doing many of these um, virtual online teachings in the last few weeks with hundreds of people, thousands of people even. And what is so comforting is to feel the sense how we're all in this together. We're all engaging in these practices together and that Everything we do has echoes in the universe, that we're never just practicing for ourselves, that we're really practicing for everyone. So I wanna thank you for your kind attention and I'm gonna turn it back over to Parmeet for some questions. Beautiful, thank you so much, Shauna. That was, um, what I really loved about that practice was how you ended it with reiterating what's important for our learning. You know, what is the one thing that that we can all walk away with. Um, so thank you for that, that was beautiful. Uh, one of the uh, questions that comes around the idea of practice is, you know, everybody's really busy right now, everybody's feeling stressed, they're at home, there's a lot going on. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people are feeling, you know, I would love to do this, I would love to sit and meditate in the morning, but I don't have that much time. So how would you respond? How can somebody even begin to do this practice? Yeah, it's a great question. So a couple of things. First of all, all of us feel that way. So it's natural, right? Trying to find time is challenging. There's a, there, what I tell people, 
is first we know what you practice grows stronger. So of course, practicing is good. But there's also research that shows that there's kind of a threshold of 12 minutes a day. And so if you can carve out these 12 minutes a day, what they find is that's where you start seeing the improvements in your immune function and your sleep quality um, in your happiness levels. And so what I tend to recommend for my clients is even just beginning with one minute a day. I think it's really important to set kind of um, attainable goals so that we trust ourselves when we make a commitment and everyone can find one minute a day. And so we start there and we slowly grow. I think it's very um, problematic when we try to do things perfectly and we overextend and then we kind of, um, and we fail because then we don't trust ourselves. So I would say start small. And in terms of beginning a practice, um, you can go to my website. I have many free meditations on the website that you can look at. But I think what's most important is to know what your intention is, to know why you're practicing, because that motivates you. So you know your intention and then you find a place to practice and a time. And I schedule it in because otherwise it won't happen. We have four kids and dogs and full time jobs. So we schedule it in and make sure that it's something that I know I can commit to every day. And in terms of time to practice, I used to tell people do it whenever you can. Um, but actually, there's recent research last year published at UC San Francisco that shows our mood in, our, in the morning and our mood at night determines the health of our mitochondria, the length of our telomeres. It's really important for our health. And so now it makes really good sense to practice in the morning and in the night, which interestingly maps perfectly onto spiritual traditions. That was beautiful. I, I, I love the specificity of your response. Thank you, Shana. Um, so we have another question here from Julie who says, uh, please say more about the curiosity part. Uh, do I need to be curious about myself and issue or the world? Yeah, great question. So what I have found, I've been studying curiosity and kindness a lot because as I mentioned, those I think are essential elements of mindfulness that are often overlooked or ignored. And what's really interesting is both curiosity and kindness have these this impact in the body that helps us learn. Curiosity turns on our learning centers, curiosity about our own experience. So what am I feeling? My, you know, my thoughts, my body sensations, my emotions, but also curiosity about the world. The, word mindfulness um, in Vipassana, it translates loosely as insight. So it's called an insight meditation where we have these insights about the nature of reality. For example, that everything's impermanent or that everything's connected. Um, so we have these insights about the world and also these insights about ourselves where we realize, wow, I'm, I'm actually not angry. I'm feeling tremendous grief or um, the reason I become so reactive here is because I'm scared. And so the curiosity helps us gain insight. When we're curious, we're more open, um, not in terms of trying to figure it out, but in terms of listening. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Lynn who says, is it possible to meditate while doing something strenuous like mountain biking? I think she probably meant being more mindful rather than meditating. Yeah. It's a great question. And so I want to be really clear if I wasn't that mindfulness and meditation are distinct and mindfulness has to do with intention, attention, attitude. And we can apply this in every moment from mountain biking to mindful eating to mindful sex, that mindfulness is a way of being in our lives. Meditation is a formal practice we do to cultivate mindfulness. And so you wouldn't be formally meditating while you're mountain biking, but you can certainly be growing your mindfulness during mountain biking. And I think that also points to this, the, um, I kind of want to underscore the attitude portion that you outlined, Shona, because I think that's so important. I, I mean, we can shame ourselves for not being mindful or we can shame ourselves for, you know, not, um, being able to meet this crisis in the expected ways and sort of, you know, how the, the way that we want to respond and help others and maybe we're not able to do that. And I think this really ties well to your good morning, I love you philosophy, which is really all about kindness and self-compassion. So could you speak a little bit more to that and, and what, you know, what made you write that book with that, with that mm -hmm. title? Yeah, thank you. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think all of us hold ourselves to these standards, right? 
now we're in a pandemic and we should be learning new languages and eating, you know, perfectly healthy and working out that there's this constant striving uh, for perfection, which doesn't exist. Perfection isn't possible, but transformation is. And that's what I'm really interested in is how do we help people change? How do we help people transform? And what I found is it's through kindness and compassion. And it's really been a lifelong journey for me because when I first started practicing mindfulness almost 25 years ago, it really became this kind of competitive, rigid, very, um, very cold practice where I was focusing so much on, on my attention, but not at all on my attitude. And really the reason I wrote the book with, with the title, Good Morning, I Love You, even though I'm a scientist and everyone said, no, don't do that, it's gonna ruin it, but was because this practice of, of learning how to greet myself with kindness, learning how to bring compassion to myself, the ripples of that out into the world have been profound. And I think that's one of the most important elements of mindfulness. In fact, the Japanese character for mindfulness is comprised of two characters. It's um, The first one means presence or attention and the bottom one, shin, means mind or heart. So mindfulness could have been translated as heartfulness. And I think we miss that. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. What a great reminder uh, to bring our hearts along with us uh, when when we practice, but really in all of our interactions throughout the day, um, being present with someone is really about opening up your heart with that sense of curiosity and kindness that you so beautifully shared. Uh, so we're coming up on time. Um, and I just want to say that uh, I know, Shauna, you also have a video associated with uh, Good Morning, I Love You that folks can access. Um, so do you mind sharing how they can connect with you, you know, in addition to, you know, going to your website? Um, how can they uh, connect with that video? So we just created a beautiful Good Morning, I Love You practice video. And if you go to my website and send me an email, I'll send you the link for it. It's free. You can just have it. And if you have any questions or follow up, please send me an email through my website. I always respond and I would love to hear from you. Beautiful, thank you so much, Shauna. This has been such an amazing session and I, uh, I'm really walking away with uh, a greater clarity around uh, how to practice uh, and just a reminder that what we practice does grow stronger. Uh, and with that reminder, I also wanna let everybody know that you know if you haven't down downloaded the Wise at Work app already, please do so. Uh, this It's a fantastic way to grow your practice. We have hundreds of meditations there on all the different concentration, compassion, uh, and insight practices that, that help to grow our mindfulness. If you have any questions related to uh, what we do at Wisdom Labs, please do reach out to us at info at wisdomlabs.com. Uh, and please join us next week where we will be speaking with Emiliana Simon Thomas, who's the science director at the Greater Good Science Center. Uh, and she'll be speaking about belonging, connection, and inclusivity uh, despite physical distancing. So thank you again so much, Shauna. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate all the work that you do in the world. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, take good care and we'll see you next week. Thank you.